Good morning. Today's reading will be from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I will be reading from the New International Version, if you'd like to follow along. It is as follows. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Before beginning his public ministry, Jesus spends intentional time in a wilderness space a place removed from ordinary rhythms and familiar routines. It is a time of prayer for Jesus, a time of saying no to demanding appetites for the purpose of clarifying that for which he was most hungry, a time of wrestling with Satan in order to ensure that his priorities and vision were aligned with those of the one who had sent him. The wilderness for Jesus seemed to be a place of discerning what to embrace and what to reject what to affirm and what to resist so that his ministry might be everything he wanted it to be. I would now like to offer you some questions for your continuing reflection. These questions are also available in the print version of the devotional, which is available through the link on the conference website. They are as follows. What are you designating as your wilderness place this Lent season? In other words, what personal space away from familiar rhythms and routines Will you designate this Lent as a place of prayer and solitude? Will it be a different room than which you normally pray, or a different corner? A different chair, or perhaps a different space altogether? Where might God be calling you to establish a new wilderness space that might enable you to listen with renewed attentiveness? Question two. Where might God be calling you to practice the discipline of fasting this Lent? Is God calling you to abstain from a meal or a routine or perhaps technology? Where do you sense the Holy Spirit leading you to say a temporary no to certain appetites so that you might re-engage your deepest hunger for the things that matter most? And the final question, what would you identify as the foundational priorities that determine your decision-making, your behavior, and your vision for your church's ministry? Where do you sense that those priorities need to be clarified? In your ministry of prayer today, I hope that you will embrace the following points of prayerful focus. Prayer for you and your congregation to be hungry for the holiest things. Prayer for realignment with christ honoring priorities and a recommitment to the things that Jesus values. Prayer for a meaningful, healing, and transformational Lenten journey. Prayer for those whose wilderness is a place of pain and suffering at present. Join me in prayer. Father God, thank you for all that you do. Lord God, we pray that this Lent, you will help us to take time away from the distractions, Lord God, away from the familiar routines, and just help us just to really recenter, re-engage, and refocus our lives on you, Lord God. Help us to go to this place of quiet and solitude, to really listen for you, Lord God, and to listen for your calling as to where you might be leading us in our ministries. Lord God, we also pray for those who are suffering at the present. Uh, we pray that they will just feel your presence, Lord God, and just be surrounded by your peace and your comfort. Um, again, we thank you for all that you do for us, and we thank you for being a good father. In your name we pray. Amen. From the fourth chapter of John, verses 5 to 42. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, 
tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you have said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know this man really is the Savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is the third Sunday in this Lenten series, Living the Baptismal Calling. Today's focus is on the third and fifth baptismal questions. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church, which he has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And 
by the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. In an encounter with a woman at a well in Samaria, Jesus confesses who he is, the Messiah. And she not only embraces it, but leads to make the same confession. Why are you here today? Why are you a Christian? Why do you follow Jesus? Why have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church that Christ has opened to all people of all ages, nations, and races. Why have you committed yourself according to the grace given to you to be a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? How are you living out this vow made at your baptism? How are you living out this vow made when you professed your faith? Even if I give you a few minutes to answer each question, there are too many to consider. The truth is these are questions that will take a lifetime for us to answer. Because the answers don't come out of what we say. They come out of how we live our lives each day. Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well is amazing. This woman, who has obviously not had an easy life, holds her own in this conversation with Jesus. Now, she is not the most theologically informed person, but she knows the regulations about ritual purity. She knows about the ancestral traditions of Israel, including the necessity to worship at a valid temple. She knows the expectation of a Messiah. She is conversant in Samaritan theology, which is not surprising since Samaritans provided religious education for both male and female children. Jesus takes her as seriously as a discussion partner as he did Nicodemus in the previous chapter. This series of conversations that Jesus is having shows that people are progressively living into their understanding of who Jesus is. The Samaritan woman is clearly a true believer. Where Nicodemus's encounter, as we talked about it last week, was under the cover of darkness, the Samaritan woman encountered Jesus at noontime, in the open, at a public well, in the full light of day. While religious authorities tend to be skeptical about Jesus, this woman comes to have faith in Jesus Christ and goes public with her experience. Immediately after the encounter with Jesus, she heads to her village to confess to others that she has met the long-awaited Messiah. She becomes the very first Christian missionary. Because of her testimony, others come to believe. What convinced her? What caused this woman to confess Jesus as her Savior, to put her whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as her Lord? Jesus knew not just her life story, but what was in her heart. He did not reject her or turn away from her. Instead, he offered her living water, life eternal. Jesus knows not just your life story, but what is in your heart. Jesus does not reject you or turn away from you. Instead, he offers you living water. He offers you life eternal. Living water. What is the living water that Jesus provides? What is this living water that changed this woman forever? It is the living water of grace and healing love. It is that which saves us. It is that which saves especially the least and the lost, the rejected and disenfranchised, the oppressed and the suffering. Once we drink the living water Jesus offers, we can no longer be satisfied by what physical water provides. Physical water can only satisfy our physical thirsts. But the living water that Jesus provides satisfies our eternal thirst. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, Jesus says. But those who drink of the water that I will give them 
and will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Sounds pretty good. As those who have in our baptismal vows confessed Jesus Christ as our Savior, put our whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church that Christ opens to the people of all ages, nations, and races. Our experience of drinking the living water offered in Christ is the same as that offered to the Samaritan woman. It is life-changing. It is deeply satisfying in a way that nothing else is. Not only is our experience the same, our mission is the same as well. Once we have tasted the living water that has become in us a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, we have become compelled to offer that water to others. How do we do that? By our testimony, both with our words and our actions. We are called to take up the baptismal calling of the church to intercede for the world by continuing to live more deeply into the mind of Christ. In the lifelong pilgrimage with the church begun in our baptism, we discover again and again that our purpose in life is deeply tied up with giving ourselves in service to others. In baptism, we step into the flow of living water, and in it, we experience a foretaste of heaven. Jesus offered the Samaritan woman living water. He said, those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. When we receive this living water, our deepest needs are satisfied. More than that, through the living water, we become part of God's blessing to the world. God created us to give ourselves for others. Self-giving is at the heart of our life in Christ. We are at once most deeply human and closest to God when we give ourselves in love. The living water offered by Jesus is available to all, Samaritan or Jews, Christian or Muslim, black or brown or white, young or old, male or female, slave or free, rich or poor. The list of dividers goes on and on. It does not matter how we divide ourselves from others. God's grace is offered to all who will drink it. We who drink of this living water, we who have come to faith and who claim faith in Jesus Christ, we can only testify to what drinking of Jesus' living water has done for us. We cannot give the living water of faith to others. But we can become part of God's blessing in this world. We can join in God's mission by giving ourselves in love. We can commit ourselves anew according to the grace given to us to be representatives of Jesus Christ in the world. Through our words, through our self-giving actions, we can point people to the only one who can give the living water that we need. Today's gospel account of the encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman at the well beautifully illustrates this week's baptismal questions in action. When Jesus offers living water to the woman, Jesus is modeling what it means to be a part of his church that he opens to people of all ages, nations, and races. The Samaritan woman confesses Jesus as the Savior. She puts her whole trust in his grace because she has experienced his grace toward her. And even though he knows all about her past and present, she serves him as Lord and represents him by becoming an evangelist to the people of her village. And they begin to believe at first because of her confession and then because Jesus agreed to stay among them two days longer, they got to know him. Jesus unites us. Jesus invites us. We confess. We trust. We serve. We represent him. We testify to what drinking of Jesus' living water has done for us. And so I ask you now, 
Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church, which he has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And by the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? And all of God's people said, Amen.